When I was a child, my brother would tell me a bedtime story about the man who murdered our father. Hey everybody, it's Charlie. This is going to be my Game of Thrones Season 8 Episode 2 video. So everybody grab your Valyrian swords or dragon glass weapons. Here we go. I'm doing Game of Thrones videos all season long. Be sure to subscribe to get everything if you're new to the channel. And we're also doing a new round of that HBO Now giveaway. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and leave a comment on the video. Careful for spoilers from Episode 2, obviously. We do Top 10 WTF and Easter eggs from the books. Starting with number 15, The Trial of Jaime Lannister, a nice mirror for Tyrion's trial during season 4 and Cersei having to take the walk of shame. All of the Lannister children now have been held to task for their past misdeeds. Tyrion's really the only one of them who was on trial for a crime that he did not commit, although he had plenty of past misdeeds that he was not being tried for. There were all kinds of references from Daenerys to him becoming the Kingslayer, you killed my father. Apparently Viserys told her a lot of stories about Jaime when she was young. You promised me an army. All I see before me is one man with one hand. Everybody seems like they're trying to set Jaime off, but he takes it really calmly until Bran gave him that record drop moment just like he gave Littlefinger during season 7. Chaos is a ladder. In Jaime's case, it was the quote that he gave him before he pushed him out the window. The things I do for love. They call out the fact several times during the episode that Jamie has been on the opposite side or enemies with pretty much everybody in this room. Like we here all at one point wanted to kill the Starks. Now we're here defending it when they're sitting around the hearth at the end of the episode. Think about how pissed Tywin Lannister would be if you were alive to see them do this, which I think is also a nice name drop from Tyrion reminding you about Bronn's secret mission to assassinate them with the crossbow he used to kill Tywin during season four. Important detail too, according to Jamie, the Golden Company troops that Cersei has, give or take 20,000 minus the ones that Euron has already killed, she'll have enough people to defeat anyone who survives the battle with the White Walkers during episode 3 next week. Or at least Jamie thinks so, unless there's some other big twist, which I talk about towards the end of this video when I start talking about the White Walkers. I think there's going to be a big twist with the Night King and I don't think he's going to do what you expect him to do. Like Bran was trying to concoct this plan to lure him out into the open. There's a really important reason why I don't think that's going to work. I love that Jamie refused to apologize for killing the Mad King. I do it again in a second. I was protecting my family, my house. He refuses to apologize to Sansa for taking in Ned Stark. I was acting under orders. It was time of war. I did what I needed to do. But later in the episode, he opens his conversation with Bran by apologizing for pushing him out the window. 14, though, was just setting up the brienne Jamie arc during the season. They have one of the most compelling relationships on the show. I know there's all this Tormund stuff and they're using for comedy in the background. The big woman's still here. But really, I think it's all about Brienne and Jamie's relationship. So I'll talk about what that is because it's not quite the same thing as Gendry and Arya's relationship or Jon Snow and Daenerys' relationship. I think the show has just done a lot more work establishing their relationship than say like Jon Snow and Daenerys' relationship, which they kind of sped through season seven. Like they meet and then a couple episodes later, they're deeply in love. There were a lot of callbacks during Brienne's testimony all the way back to season three. He protected me at the cost of his hand. That was Locke's group during season three. And Brienne also very aptly puts that the only reason why Sansa is alive because of an oath that Jaime swore to Catelyn Stark to help find her children and bring them home, which is why he gave Brienne Oathkeeper in her armor and set her off on her way. The way Sansa explained it during the episode, though, is that she trusts Brienne and Brienne trusts Jaime. It's not that Sansa trusts Jaime. She's just willing to give him the benefit of the doubt based on Brienne's testimony. And because of the Cersei twist, almost none of them are listening to Tyrion. So he's kind of on the outs for most of the episode. Number 13, Jaime and Bran's reunion in the Godswood. So this is sort of Bran telling Jaime that he only could become the man he is today if he had pushed Bran out the window. If he had not, he would still be the golden trash bag character that he was at the beginning of season one. It doesn't absolve Jamie of any of his guilt, and he has this really funny reaction to Bran when Bran explains how he's not Bran Stark anymore. I'm kind of the three-eyed raven. It's the same quizzical look that Sansa had on her face when Bran told the same thing to her. I don't know what that means. Three-eyed raven, what's that? Even though Bran has green sight and he probably has an idea for what Jamie's role is specifically, he doesn't come right out and tell him. And I love the way they leave their conversation too. This is that why should you worry about whether or not I'm going to tell anyone the truth about what you did to me? Because we all might die tomorrow. So what would it matter after that? So you almost get a version of that same extreme Jamie reaction face that you got at the end of episode one when he first noticed Bran. Like, oh my God. 
But number 12, Jamie and Tyrion's reunion, they have a funny moment just remarking about how things have changed so much since the pilot episode. Remember the last time we were here? My golden days are behind me. Tyrion says his whoring days are behind him. And they have that funny moment where the Stark soldiers on the balcony just spit down at them. But turns out they also kind of hate Daenerys too. So Tyrion tries to reassure Jamie like things aren't quite so bad. They sort of reflect on Jamie's relationship with Cersei and Tyrion actually quotes himself from earlier on the show. So when he talks about the way that he wants to die, when I'm 80 years old in my bed, so on and so forth, that was actually a line of dialogue from way back, I think it was either season one or season two, when he was talking to the Crow Hills clans of the Vale, when he was with Bronn, they got captured. He was trying to talk the Storm Crows into taking him back to Tywin for a really big reward. The weird thing about Tyrion in the episode too is that there were a couple different conversations that he had where he talked about his own death as if he's prophesying his own death before the end of the series. So just watch out for him. Any character that talks about their own death that much is probably going to wind up dying at some point. Number 11 was Jamie and Brienne's reunion in the yard. They have a conversation about Pod, which seems kind of funny, but really it's a metaphor for what's going on with Jamie during this season. So Jamie says he's come a long way, but Brienne says he's still got a lot to learn. Just saying that, you know, even though Jamie is doing the right thing now, trying to be honorable, he still has a long way to go before he completely redeems himself. Brienne stops him short as they're talking about battle planning. Why aren't you insulting me? And it's sort of them acknowledging the air between them, where they left things last time, where they know that they care about each other, but because neither one of them is completely prepared to directly address the way they feel about each other, she just kind of pushes them away. And it gets even more tense towards the end of the episode. But I do feel like the two of them later in the episode probably had one of the best scenes in the entire episode. Number 10 was Daenerys versus Sansa. So this actually lets you know about what's going to be happening after the big battle of Winterfell. Like what happens when we defeat the Night King? There's still going to be a lot of problems to solve. They're both wearing their new outfits. Sansa has her new leather armor on. Daenerys has the new fur-lined dress. They make remarks about families being very complicated. Obvious setup for the R plus L equals J info bomb that Jon is getting ready to drop on her. The fact that it's just going to complicate both of their families, Stark and Targaryen. They make a joke about Jon Snow being short because she was talking about Khal Drogo, who was the man that you loved before John. She talks about someone who was taller. That was Khal Drogo that she was referring to. But the real tension between the two of those characters is all about what happens to the North after they win the battle, defeat Cersei, and put Daenerys on the Iron Throne. Sansa wants continued independence for the North after the battle. Daenerys clearly isn't ready to offer that to her, so they're going to have to circle back around to that after the big battle to address it before the finale. The reason they're cut short, though, is actually great. Number nine, Theon in Sansa's reunion. This is actually one of the more touching reunions in the episode. It reminds you of the beginning of season six when they first escaped Winterfell together. So there were actually a couple of really good Sansa Theon scenes during the episode. She seems like she cares about him a lot. The whole reason he came back, though, is obviously to atone for what he did. He even references it later when Bran explains his plan for bringing the Night King out into the open in the godswood. Let me defend you with the Ironborn. So it's sort of him atoning for sacking Winterfell fell during season two. But like I said, I think there's going to be a big twist with Bran's special plan in the Night King. I don't think it's going to work, so I don't think things are going to go down the way they think they will. Number eight, though, Jon Snow's reunion with Ed and Tormund. So this is actually just a funny moment where he sees Ed and the music swells up, but Tormund almost tackles him out of frame before he can hug Ed. Tormund was like the master blocker this episode. Like he shows up just to make things awkward with Brienne and Jamie later in the episode. He stops Jon Snow from hugging Ed. Tormund is a master at stepping in between people. The whole point of this scene, though, was just to catch everyone up to speed about what happened at the last hearth. R.I.P. Little Lord Umber. And they basically say that anyone who hasn't already made it to Winterfell, like the Glovers over in Deepwood Mod, they're already part of the Army of the Dead. So I think that's a way to say that by the time the White Walkers have shown up at the end of the episode, walk into frame, they've already hit Deepwood Mott. So all the Glovers are somewhere walking around with the other Whites in the background. But number seven, the big battle planning scene. So there's this montage, Jon Snow giving voiceover and inspirational battle planning speech while they all show off the defenses around Winterfell. He explains that they only need to kill the Night King to stop the entire army of the dead and the other White Walkers. So that's when Bran launches into his big explainer. The really cool extra new detail we get, I don't know if this is a book thing that George R. R. Martin helped them with, or if this is just the showrunners sort of coming up with this on the fly, is that they say that the Three-Eyed Raven is one of many in a line of Three-Eyed Ravens that the Night King has been trying to kill up to this point. So the main target, as we all suspected earlier this season, is Bran himself. 
the actor that plays the Night King before the season started did a big interview where he says, oh, I have a target during the season. The Night King is coming for someone. You'll learn what it is. But number six, Bran explains his plan for luring him out into the open. Now, Bran seems like he's assuming that the Night King is going to come to Winterfell, but I actually don't think that he's going to show up because what happens at the end of the episode when the White Walkers walk into frame on their horses? You don't see the Night King anywhere and you don't hear the dragon screeching or flying in the background. So for all we know, the Night King has turned around and gone down to King's Landing to try and start creating whites down there so that they have to fight a war on two fronts instead of just this battle of Winterfell. But Bran's plan is to just wait for him in the godswood and use himself as bait. So that's you know, when Theon jumps in and says, we'll protect you. But like I said, I don't think that it's going to go down the way they expect it to. Bran and Samwell's explanation for why the Night King wants to kill him is a little more eloquent, but it actually does line up with most people's fan theories. Just that the Night King wants to bring winter to the entire world, a never-ending winter. That's why they call it the Long Night. He wants to end man as a species, and Bran says the reason why he wants to kill him because he's a living memory of everything that's happened in the world. So you kill him, you kill memories of that. And then Samwell launches into a much more eloquent explainer for it all, which may be set up for that Lord of the Rings style twist that everyone was joking about last season. What if Samwell is the one to write the book about what just happened and he calls it a song of ice and fire? Samwell says that's what death is, forgetting being forgotten. And the way that you do not forget is that you write stories down. So hopefully they won't be quite so on the nose about it, a la Lord of the Rings. But let me know in the comments if you actually think that that's going to happen based on what Samwell is saying in this moment. There are a couple of really great smaller scenes with a lot of the characters having moments together. Like you have the Night's Watch brothers standing on the battlements like they stood on the wall during season one. Samwell talking to Ed and Jon Snow, them sort of poking fun at Sam. Well, Samwell, Slayer of White Walkers, Lover of Ladies, we're really screwed now if this is what it's come to. They try to give all the main characters moments like this, like you have the Sir Jorah moment with the little bear where she tells him, I wish you good fortune in the wars to come. And he's like, okay, fine, because she doesn't want to hide down in the crypts with everyone else. So we did finally get a Sir Jorah little bear scene, but that's probably going to be the extent of it. I don't expect them to get a whole lot of time together. Number five was everyone around the hearth. Even though they tried to play it really comedically, there were a couple of really great moments. It went a little over the top with Tormund explaining himself. Like, do you know how I got the name Tormund Giant's Bane? Killed a giant when I was 10, climbed in bed with his wife, and the giantess thought I was her child. Suckled me at her teeth for three months. That's how I got so strong. Giant's milk. And then just gulps a whole bunch of it down from his horn there. The funniest thing about this scene, though, is actually Brienne's horrified reaction. You just see her speechless there, just trying to take it all in. Oh, my God, what did I just hear? And during all those moments where he was trying to proposition Brienne, you could actually see her in frame with Jamie just out of focus. And it was just sort of their way of addressing the funny love triangle that's been happening for the past couple of seasons. But like I said, I think this is all about Jamie and Brienne. They've been setting that up ever since season three, ever since he explained why he became the Kingslayer. Number four was Arya's second reunion with the Hound, which was a little more personal, but they also got the reunion with Beric, who she hasn't seen since season three. I love the way she checked him too. What are you doing here? You've never fought from anyone but yourself. And then he remarks, I fought for you, didn't I? Which is a way to show you that they both come a long way. He's actually being more honorable, being a good person. She's kind of gone in the opposite direction, even though she is fairly well adjusted. She is a stone cold killer at this point. They drop a really big Red Wedding reference when Beric walks up and the Hound gets really pissed off. Oh, we might as well be at a bloody wedding. Which at the end of season three, they walked up at the twins right after the Red Wedding had gone down. Arya lets us know that Beric isn't on her list anymore. I think that happened during season six when the Wake was questioning him. And it was just a really way of acknowledging how Arya cared about the Hound at that point. Number three, though, was Arya and Gendry finally doing the deed as awkward as possible as you would expect from a couple people like that. Arya's first time, I won't want to die without experiencing this, so let's just get it on, get it over with. I'm not the Red Woman, take your own damn pants off. She seems a little surprised when he tells her about his true origin. I'm Robert Baratheon's bastard, but I don't think that mattered to her before, so I don't think that it really changes anything about the way she feels about Gendry. The other really interesting thing, too, about their scene is that when she's taking her clothes off, Gendry notices all of her scars from her training. It's the same kind of look that Daenerys gave Jon Snow when she saw all of his scars during Season 7, Episode 6. Like, wow, what happened there? There's clearly a story behind all those scars. Number two, though, obviously, was Jamie knighting Brienne. If you didn't recognize, they were actually playing the same soundtrack from when he gave her Oathkeeper, even though it sounded like an Oathkeeper theme song. 
The name of the song is actually called Kingslayer, so it started out as a Jamie Lannister theme. Then once they got to season four, their relationship had blossomed a little bit more. It turned into a theme for both of them in that Oathkeeper moment. So I think of the song as more of an Oathkeeper theme, which makes sense now that he's knighting her Rise, a Knight of the Seven Kingdoms. The really interesting book easter egg there is that A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms is a reference to the book called A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms, which covers the adventures of Duncan Egg that George R. R. Martin wrote. Within the world of A Song of Ice and Fire, Brienne of Tarth is actually related to Sir Duncan the Tall. If you couldn't tell what that Podrick song was too, big surprise twist, Pod is apparently a really amazing singer. Maybe the other surprise twist is that that's what he did to the girls in the whorehouse so many seasons ago. Like what did he do to those girls that make them love him so much? But the name of the song that he's singing is called Jenny's Song, and it's fabled that the song was always requested from Jenny by the Ghost of the High Heart as payment in exchange for telling the Brotherhood Without Banners of her prophetic dreams. So it's kind of a book easter egg for something that they didn't really do on the TV show, but obviously the song itself is just really nice the way they use it during the episode. I love the transition to the next big Jon Snow Daenerys scene too. As the song is being sung, you have this big montage, you see all the different characters and groups all around the castle. You see Daenerys enter the crypts as Jon Snow is standing at Lyanna Stark's statue and she remarks about Rhaegar Targaryen. Oh, he did all these terrible things to Lyanna Stark. They said that he was a great singer, obviously referencing the Jenny of Oldstone song. That compels Jon Snow to tell her the truth and she doesn't believe it almost as much as Jon Snow didn't believe it. He was a little quicker to believe what Samo was telling him. Oh, your best friend and your brother told you something and you're going to believe it outright. It's true. I know it's true. The way they're spinning Daenerys' reaction is that she's thinking more of it from a succession standpoint. Oh, you have a claim to the Iron Throne now. You're competing with me for the thing that I've wanted this whole time. Even though I think that they're overblowing that point a little bit, they're probably going to use it as a point of drama between the two of them for the rest of the season, at least until the last couple of episodes. Everything goes wrong for everyone all at the same time as things just start spinning out of control as the White Walkers arrive. The horn sounds, the White Walkers arrive, but like I said, I think the twist that we're not expecting here is that the Night King won't even be at this battle. It'll just be his White Walker generals and the Army of the Dead, and the Night King will try to beeline down for King's Landing. So prepare yourself. Next week will be their Helm's Deep episode, as they're calling it, Lord of the Rings style. Just an episode where it's nothing but this giant battle going on. The biggest battle in TV history. So it is going to be epic. The episode's going to be way longer than episodes one and two. So I might have to do like a top 20 WTF video. But leave all your questions in the comments below. I'll do an episode three trailer video tomorrow. I'll name a giveaway winner when I post that in a Q&A video on Tuesday, just like I did last week. But while you wait for everything, click here for my Arya and Gendry Season 8 video, and click here for my Game of Thrones Season 8 Episode 1 video. Thank you so much for watching. Everybody stay awesome. I'll see you guys tonight.